Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we, we praise and we thank you for the amazing grace that you have offered to us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Father, because all of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory, and the wages of sin is death, because we are born spiritually dead, we deserve nothing but justice. And yet you, Lord, in your grace sent your Son, who died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, so that all who repent and turn to Jesus Christ in faith would receive this free gift of salvation. God, we thank and praise you. And Lord, even as we thank and praise you for this gift that impacts our lives both now and throughout eternity, we also, Father, just, we, we want to pray, we want to pray for our nation in this culture. Father, I'm just reminded of Isaiah 5, 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness in light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Father, in so many ways, our culture is shaking its fist at you. We reject you. We reject your design for everything, it seems. And Father, within that, we see the spiritual carnage and damage all over this country. It goes from broken homes, Father, to broken people, to cities actually giving people drugs on the streets, to lawlessness being excused. Father, we need you. And Lord, forgive us, your church, for not being the salt and light that we should be. Forgive us, Father, for when we are not being Christ's ambassadors, sharing the good news, because, Father, that's what's needed. The good news is needed in this dark culture, Father. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict and work in our lives so that we would shine brightly, so that those who are in darkness can see the light, can see hope, can come to faith in Christ. Father, as Habakkuk prayed, I pray for our nation in this way, in wrath, remember mercy. Father, I pray it would be pleasing to you once more to pour out your spirit on this land. Revive and reform your church, Lord, and grant us great grace and focus to run the race well that is set before us. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are taking a brief break from our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Romans. And we are looking today and the following week, we're looking at elders, deacons, and congregations. And, and what does all that mean? Let's start off by saying this. Oh, I should start off by saying this. If you take notes, you might want to have a pen handy because you're going to take a lot of notes for, as far as cross-references. And I encourage you, study on your own, okay? When we talk about God, one of the things that we see throughout Scripture is that God is a God of order. The creator of all things has a design for all things, and in each design, there's order. So when Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 14, he's addressing a church that is, is divided, it's chaotic, disorderly, and as such, there's no peace in the church. After he gives instructions on how the body, how people are to relate to one another, and how spiritual gifts are to be used, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 14.33, which is your first cross-reference note. 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. That word confusion can also be translated disorder. So God is not the God of confusion or disorder. He is the God of order and of peace. Going back to this, as we pray for the culture, we see so much disorder because we see so much a rejection for all that God has said, for his design, his purposes. The idea of God being a God of order is throughout Scripture. You think with me, all of God's creation is ordered. Nothing about the universe, the earth, the human body is haphazard or disorderly. 
We see patterns of order in the laws of nature and science. We see order in gender and marriage and family. And even though we are all sinners by nature and spiritually dead apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore alienated from God in our natural state because of our sin, because of that, we're not living life according to the way that God designed it. It's a disordered life that we all live apart from Christ, meaning we do not live for his glory and the blessing of others. We do not live in intimacy with him. But God has given us a way so that we can live according to his design, and it is the only way as Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's a very exclusive claim. You can't go around Jesus. You can't add Jesus plus somebody else. You must come to faith in Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus, God the Son, is the gift of God the Father to a broken, sinful humanity that you and I might become new creations, forgiven, adopted into his family, that we might relate to him as he intends and relate to others as he intends. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 10.10? 10? He said that he came to give life, and to give it to the fullest, or to give it abundantly, to give it meaningfully. So when we repent of our sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, we now have eternal life, but now we also have a meaningful life because of Christ, where we can now, because we are new creations, live for the glory of God and the blessing of others. Our relationship to and with Jesus reorients and reorders everything. We build our lives on him. Because God is a God of order, it should not surprise us that when it comes to his church, the Lord has an order for his church. We're, we are looking again at, at, at that order today in our sermon series, and, and the sermon series is designed to show the biblical pattern for the Lord's order in his church. And this sermon is meant to complement, the sermon series rather, is meant to complement the books we are studying in elders that we have. If you don't have a copy, I think we have some more available, but this is meant to complement that and to give a biblical framework for elders as we look at our constitution. And I encourage you to look at that. And again, constitution team, I am so thankful. Side note, it, the blessing of the brothers and sisters who worked on this how deep they dove into the word and in prayer with this one sole objective, we want everything to be aligned with scripture. That's how everything should be. So I thank God for them. I thank God for the grace that he gives to persevere. And I look forward to what he has for us. Now, when we start talking about order in the church, there's something we have to be very clear on first. This is, you cannot go past this if you don't get this. Here's the first point. Jesus is the head of the church. The church belongs to him. Colossians 1, 18. Colossians 1, 18a says, and he, being Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. You might say, well, why, why are you starting there if you're talking about elders and deacons and the congregation? Well, there are a lot of reasons we have to start here. First, if we forget who the head of the church is, we're going to end up doing church according to our design, in our strength, in our wisdom. And the church becomes this mere human enterprise built around man, the desires of man, the wisdom of man, the plans of man. Because Jesus is head of the church, another reason this is important is that as believers, if you're born again, we must come under his lordship as his people. There are not two tracks contrary to popular belief of salvation. One saying, oh, you can just do the salvation and, and get eternal life track. And the other one is, no, Jesus is Lord. No, Jesus is Savior and Lord. We don't split those two. Because Jesus is the head of the church, that means also that we must preach his word. Not the opinion of man, not human wisdom or human philosophy, it also means that we pray, we, 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 we seek his face, we want to do all things for his glory. We ask him for wisdom and direction, and it means that we worship him. Him. 
It means we are to follow in obedience. We are to follow as he leads. We're to walk by faith. And we are to order our individual lives and our church life around him and his word. Jesus is not only the head of the church. He is the chief architect, the builder of the church. He says this, basically, the church is mine. Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, I don't have time to get into the wordplay there. He's actually building the rock. He's talking about Peter's confession, not Peter the Pope, because that, that's absolutely unbiblical. You see that nowhere in Scripture. He says, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus says, I will be, build my church. So again, notice my church, he's saying, the church is his It goes back to him being the head. He says, I will build my church. That also points to Jesus as the architect, the builder, the owner, and the Lord of the church because he's saying, I will be the one who builds my church. We don't build the church. We don't build it through human ingenuity or around the cult of personality or by dedicating ourselves to church growth principles. And so many churches do that. If you just do this, 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 they will come. No, we are called to be faithful to the Lord our God. We look to the Lord Jesus because he is the one who builds his church. That Greek word for church means the called out ones. This is important for us to understand. That refers to those who've been born again. That's the church. Those who have repented of their sin and trusted in Christ alone for salvation. So the church that Jesus is talking about is not a building. It's not those who gather within a church building because we know that not all who gather have been born again. He's talking about the people he has redeemed, those he has saved. That is his church. And brothers and sisters, you need to know this. His church will not fail. Individual congregations will, and they may. But the church universal will continue to expand across time and geography amongst all people groups, and nothing can or will stop that. So when it comes to the church, we also see this about Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone. 1 Peter 2, 6 and 7. 1 Peter 2, 6 and 7, for it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The cornerstone is a stone that sets the foundation and squares a building. When it comes to the spiritual house that Jesus Christ is building, he is the cornerstone. His church cannot be built on personalities people, traditions, or anything else other than Jesus. Everything comes back to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the architect and the builder of the church, because he is a God of order, we should not be surprised that he has actually given order to the church, and he has given the the church two offices, two offices for the blessing of the church. We see his design for the church all over the New Testament. It's everywhere. In the New Testament, you see the two offices the Lord has given his church are that of deacons and elders. Those are your two offices that God has given. Now, there are various giftings. There are various ministries that involve all church members. So if you are born again, the Holy Spirit lives within you. And he has given you spiritual gifts, and you are to exercise those gifts in ministry and service. We are not saved to consume. We're not saved to sit, soak, and sour. We are saved to serve. So this involves all church members, but there are only two offices. And these two offices, again, are that of deacon and elder. And they both serve a unique role, and they are to complement one another. We'll start this part of the study by looking at the Greek words in the New Testament for deacon and elder. The Greek word for deacon is diakonos. That, that word literally means servant or attendant. Deacons in the church serve the physical needs of the church uh, members through prayer, through caring, 
meeting tangible needs in the church, and they also, we'll see in a bit, play a significant role in guarding the unity of the church. When it comes to elders, we see four primary words. There's four primary words used to describe the same thing, the pastors of the church. So those words are overseer, bishop, and elders, and pastor. You will run across those words depending upon your translation. But they're all used interchangeably in the New Testament to describe the same person, pastors. Elders, overseers, and bishops, and pastors do the work of pastoring the church and shepherding the flock. And one of the things that we will see as we continue in our study, it's always a plurality of elders. The word for elders is presbyteros. The word for overseers is episkopos. That word can also be translated bishop. And the word for pastor is poimen. These words carry the idea of leadership, giving oversight, direction, shepherding. These are the primary roles of elders in the life of the church. Having said that, please know this. Elders does not mean that a group of men are the dictators. That's not eldership. Eldership is the focus on leading and shepherding the flock, preaching the word of God. Now, when it comes back to how all these things get started, let's start off by taking a look at how did deacons come into being and why. Turn to Acts 6 or write down Acts 6, 1 through 7. Acts 6, 1 through 7. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So here's the situation. The apostles needed to focus on what they were called to do, preaching, the ministry of prayer, the ministry of the word. That's their role. But the church had a need. Namely, there were widows who had some significant needs, and among the widows, there was a complaint. The Hellenist widows felt they were being neglected. This threatened the love and the unity of the church, so seven men were identified spiritually mature men who would take on the role of serving, meeting those needs, and therefore, in doing that, guarding the unity of the church. That also allowed the apostles to focus on their ministry, preaching, teaching, prayer. So again, you see order. Order. The idea, I think, has crept into evangelicalism, which is tragic. Regardless of the size of the church, if there's any paid part-time or full-time, pastor and staff is this. We pay you to do it. No. There are two offices And everyone who is saved has a ministry, okay? And when the church and those deacons and elders flesh out their roles, and when the body exercises their gifts, well, the church is healthy. It's orderly. When we get to the letters of the churches in the New Testament, we see that churches now have elders and deacons in place. So as the church expanded across the Roman Empire, the 12 apostles could not start every church, pastor every church, preach in every church. The church exploded. So what we see is that qualified men were appointed to shepherd and oversee each church. The pattern we see in Scripture is this. Elders are appointed in church. And when speaking again about elders, there's always a plurality. Here are some texts to consider regarding that. Acts 20, verse 17, we see Paul sending word to the elders in the church in Ephesus to meet with him. Now, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Now, here's the crucial part. In in the Greek, the word for elders is plural, and the word for church is singular. 
So all the elders from the church that were in Ephesus were to meet with Paul. In Acts 14, 23, Acts 14, 23, we see Paul and Barnabas appointing elders, plural, in every church, singular. Acts 14, 23 says this, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul also instructs Titus to appoint elders in every place where there was a church in Titus 1, 5 in Crete. Titus 1, 5, this is where, why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order. Do you catch this? Order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. He didn't say, hey, Titus, I'm glad you're in Crete. Go out there and you guys just do church, man. Whatever you, whatever you feel good about, whatever you want to do. He, he's telling you, this is, this, is what we, this is what God has told us to do. This is how we're going to do things. Throughout the New Testament, you're going on, again, only see these two offices, that of deacon and elder, and both are important and both serve different roles. They're to complement each other. They both need each other. Mark Dever and Paul Alexander wrote the following in their book, How to Grow and Build a Healthy Church. They said, elders need deacons to serve practically, and deacons need elders to lead spiritually. Deacons serve to care for the physical needs of the church, and they do so in a way that heals divisions, brings unity under the word, and supports the leadership of the elders. Without this practical service of the deacons, the elders will not be free to devote themselves to praying and serving the word to the people. Elders need deacons to serve practically, and deacons need elders to lead spiritually. That's the biblical pattern. That's the pattern. That's the design the Lord Jesus, who is head of the church, has for his church. Both elders and deacons also have qualifications, and we want us to take a look at those, a quick look. And I want you, when we read this passage, I want you to look for one distinct difference in terms of qualification between elder and deacon. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, which is elder, pastor, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-control, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. That refers to lost people, people who are not yet saved, so that he may not fall into disgrace into a snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Side note, sidebar, these two lists does not mean elders and deacons have to be perfect. If that was the case, in every church there would be no elders and no deacons. No Christian is perfect on this side of eternity. Both of these lists, however, are saying something very significant. These are the virtues that are to characterize these men. These are the virtues that these men are to strive toward. These are the virtues, virtues that God requires of them. They must be growing in these virtues. You'll also notice something which is unpopular in our culture, but elders are men. I know in our culture today, as we continue just to flip everything around that God has designed, it's like, well, there's nothing big with a woman pastor. That's fine. The scripture says very clearly a woman is not to exercise pastoral authority over church. There's talk where it is a design for biblical headship. This is the office is set aside for spiritually mature men in the church who can teach. It does not mean that women are less. 
What it means is that this is God's design, his order. And as you look at the qualification again for both elders and deacons, did you notice the, I mean, they were pretty much the same character requirements, but there was one difference. Teach. Who said, to someone, amen, you were listening, that's great. Only elders, the requirement was that they'd be able to teach. That's not required for the office of deacon. It doesn't mean a deacon can't teach. What it does mean is that for an elder, that's a qualification. Must be able to teach. Now, if you're saying, well, I'm not a deacon, I'm not a pastor or whatever, so, so okay. So, what, what, you know, you guys do that and, and I'll, well, something all believers need to note, God does not have one standard of holiness and virtue, one requirement for elders and deacons and then another for the rest of the church. So, he didn't lay out these qualifications for deacon and elders and say, and the rest of you guys, just kind of do your best, kids. Go out there and have fun. That's not what he's saying. D.A. Carson, who's a wonderful scholar, writes the qualities that Paul lays out for elders are elsewhere in the New Testament commanded for all Christians, every quality except the ability to teach. So it's not just like here's a track for these guys and we have our own track. All of these virtues are for all of us. So as you look at these qualities... We are to all pursue these virtues by growing in in them and valuing and treasuring them as followers of Jesus. I want us to look at a couple more things when it comes to elders. Elders are accountable to God for how they shepherd, how they shepherd the people of God. And the people of God, the church, is accountable as well for how they respond to the elders of the church. The author of Hebrews addresses this, and it's very sobering. I remember in seminary, just a, a New Testament professor, I believe, um, and he talked about this passage. If you're going into ministry, he said, if you're going to be a pastor, if you're going to be serving in the life of the church, remember this. It starts off by saying, obey, in Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders, that's elders, overseers, pastors, and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls Here's the part that's that's sobering, as those who will have to give an account. So there is a great reason, a very significant reason, why any pastor that wants to honor God approaches what he does with much fear and trembling, because we know we are accountable to him. We will have to give an account. On the other side, the author of Hebrews says, but let them, being the elders, the overseers, do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. So again, you see what? You see order. Leaders refer to elders, overseers, pastors, so we give an account to the Lord for how we shepherd his church. But notice that the church is also to make sure, the people of God are to make sure that they honor the leadership of elders in the church joyfully to willingly come under their leadership so that the elders can execute their responsibilities with great joy, not great groaning. When you see power struggles like that in the life of a church, no pastor can say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pastoring with great joy. No, there's groaning. So this is for elders. This is for pastors. This is for deacons. This is for the church. As we look at the two offices the Lord has given the church, the requirements for each, the responsibilities of each, as well as the congregation, again, we see God is a God of order, and we are to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. We align ourselves and structure everything to his will, his word, not ours, not the traditions of men. Lastly, go back to Acts 20. I want you to see something else about Jesus and his relation to and with the church, his authority and ownership of the church. I want you to notice specifically what it cost him. Another reason that we must take his design for his church seriously. He paid for it by dying for sinners. Listen to Paul's charge and his word to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, underline, which he obtained with his own blood. 
What he's saying there is, is elders, watch your life and doctrine closely. Shepherd faithfully. Be watchful. Care for the church because Jesus obtained that church with his own blood. It cost him everything. The church is made up of those who've been born again. Again, those who've repented of their sins, not those who just attend church. But you must come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and for mine. He died. He was buried. And three days later, he rose from the grave. King of kings and Lord of lords. Ephesians 1, 7 says this. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The blood of Jesus saves us, purchases us, cleanses us, and the church belongs to him because he purchased it with his blood. As such, we belong to him. We come under his authority as head. Individually and congregationally, we seek, Lord, not my will, but yours. I want to come under your authority. And as we align ourselves under the lordship of Christ, we glorify him. We find intimacy with him, peace and security and strength in him, and our lives become more ordered individually and congregationally. And as we begin to live lives far greater than the small little world we once had, we live for the king and his kingdom according to his design. Now, I recognize that there are people here today who have not yet trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, have not yet been reconciled to God. The same Jesus that I've been talking about paid the penalty for your sins, just as he did mine, as he did everyone here, took the punishment that you deserve for your sins. So if you want to know more about trusting Jesus Christ and following him, about being reconciled to God, in a moment, we're going to stand and sing and have a time of invitation. I will be in the front. We'll have a deacon on either side. Please come forward and say, I want to know more about following Jesus. And we will set up a time to meet and talk. If you are here and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you have not yet followed through in your first act of obedience, which is baptism. Baptism does not save you, but Jesus commanded it. So if you have been saved... You need to follow through with baptism. If you need to nail that down, come forward and share that. We'll set a time to talk. If you believe the Lord is calling you to plant yourself here in this church, to be on mission with us, to be in covenant relationship with us, please come forward. Church family, this is also a wonderful time during the invitation for us just to confess, Jesus, you were Lord and you were the head of a church. We want you to be glorified. We want to come under your authority. Give us clarity and wisdom to align ourselves according to your design. This is a wonderful time to pray. The Lord wants to use this church for his glory and for the blessing of many. This is a holy time. So after I pray, my encouragement is that you would respond to the Lord as he leads. If you're watching us online or later, on YouTube, if you have questions on any of these things, please send us an email at info at stonebridgesa.com and we will respond. Let's pray and you respond as he may lead. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you for your word. Father, your word is God breathed. It's authoritative for all of life. Father, we are to build our lives on your word. Our Lord and Savior said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and, and do not do what I, I command, but do what I say? Father, I pray that we would respond to the Lord Jesus Christ on his terms in all things. So for those who may be here today who need to, to trust in, in Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day that they, 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 they talk and say, I'd like to be able to, to know what it means to follow Jesus, Father. For others who, who are, are, are wrestling, Lord, with, with baptism, I pray that it would be clear that they must follow through and be obedient. And Father, for those who are looking for a church home and believe God wants them to plant here, I pray that you would give them peace to do so. And Father, for the rest of us as a church body, we pray that you, Lord Jesus, you alone, be glorified. The church is not about us. It's all about you. And Father, I ask and pray that we would respond to you now as we need to in this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.